Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start, at the very least, on my review of Oryx and Crake by Margaret Atwood. So this is sort of science fiction, speculative sci-fi, a bit of literary fiction as well. Uh, I'm, as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. This was nominated for the Man Booker Award in 2003. If that means anything to you, it doesn't to me because I don't care for literary awards myself. And I was reading the large print edition, uh, which is for people with like visual difficulties, and actually. I kind of enjoyed that. Uh, I've noticed in the past a lot of Atwood's printed books have like super small prints so I end up feeling like I'm straining my eyes to read them and uh, that wasn't a problem for this one. So the blurb. Dane reads. Snowman is sleeping in a tree, mourning the loss of his beloved Oryx and his best friend Crake, and slowly starving to death. He searches for supplies in a wasteland where insects proliferate and pigoons and wolvogs ravage the plebe lands where ordinary people once lived, and in the compounds that sheltered the extraordinary. He tries to piece together what has taken place. Why is he left with nothing but his haunting memories? Alone except for the green-eyed children of Crake, who think of him as a kind of monster, he explores the answers to these questions in the double journey he takes, into his own past, and back to Crake's high-tech bubble dome where the Paradise Project unfolded and the world came to grief. And so kind of as you can get from that, uh, we have dual timelines going on in this one, but what's interesting is that even the furthest back timeline is still kind of considerably in our future. Um, it also does a really good job of asking a lot of questions about science, like is scientific process uh, progress necessarily a good thing? Um, which is the theme shared by what I'm currently reading, which is Micro by Michael Crichton. Um, and also there's things like genetic engineering and all of that stuff. It's also part of a uh, three book trilogy from what I understand. So let's check out some tabs. So this made me laugh. Um, so the children of Crake, they keep their distance. Is that from respect, as he like to think, or because he stinks? He does stink, he knows that well enough. He's rank, he's gamey, he reeks like a walrus, oily, salty, fishy. Not that he's ever smelled such a beast, but he's seen pictures. So, um, I told my girlfriend that I'm rank, gamey, and reek like a walrus. So Snowman is named after the abominable snowman. Um, but it says, for present purposes, he's shortened the name. He's only snowman. He's kept the abominable to himself. His own secret hair shirt. Miguel, it's discouraging how grubby everyone gets without mirrors. I thought this was funny. I bear in mind he's all alone, so it's getting a bit crazy. But sometimes in the dusk, he runs up and down on the sand, flinging stones at the ocean and screaming, shit, 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 shit. He feels better afterwards. I'm sure he does. A oh, great line here. Sex is like drink. It's bad to start brooding about it too early in the day. Let me get this great little mini paragraph. His time, what a bankrupt idea. As if he's been given a box of time belonging to him alone. Stuffed to the brim with hours and minutes that he can spend like money. Trouble is, the box has holes in it and the time is running out no matter what he does with it. And this is kind of sad. He's thinking about keeping a journal like a captain going down on a ship. And he says, uh, he too is a castaway of sorts. He could make lists, it could give his life some structure. But even a castaway assumes a future reader. Someone who will come along later and find his bones in his ledger and learn his fate. Snowman can make no such assumptions. He'll have no future reader because the Krakers can't read. Any reader he can possibly imagine is in the pack. And we get a reference to the heady days of the legendary dot com bubble back in prehistory. Which is kind of what it feels like. I mean, I remember that happening. Um, but a lot of today's kids won't remember the dot-com bubble. Crake tells Jimmy he should read upon the Stoics, which he should. The Stoics, uh, Stoic philosophy is fascinating. I've read a bit of bit of Stoic philosophy. So I thought this sounded fun. This sounds like the kind of game I'd like to play, Blood and Roses. Blood and Roses was a trading game along the lines of Monopoly. The blood side played with human atrocities for the counters, atrocities on a large scale. Individual rapes and murders didn't count. There had to have been a large number of people wiped out. Massacres, genocides, that sort of thing. The Roses side played with human achievements, artwork, scientific breakthroughs, stellar works of architecture, helpful inventions, monuments to the soul's magnificence, they were called in the game. There were sidebar buttons so that if you didn't know what crime and punishment was, or the theory of relativity, or the trade of tears, or Madame Bovary, or the Hundred Years' War, or the flight into Egypt. You could double click and get an illustrated rundown in two choices. R for children, P-O-N for profanity, obscenity, and nudity. That was the thing about history, said Craig. It had lots of all three. Very true. We get a reference to Mad Adam, which I'd heard of before, and that's uh, the name of the third book in the trilogy. And this interesting bit here as well. So that was the trouble with Blood and Roses. It was easier to remember the blood stuff. The other trouble was that the blood player usually won, but winning meant you inherited a wasteland. This was the point of the game, said Craig, when Jimmy complained. Jimmy said if that was the point, it was pretty pointless. He didn't want to tell Craig that he was having some severe nightmares. The one where the Parthenon was decorated with cut-off heads was, for some reason, the worst. It's kind of a bit of foreshadowing. Not the heads thing, but the wasteland thing. I thought this was deep. 
and I'm 13. Toast was a pointless invention from the Dark Ages. Toast was an implement of torture that caused all those subjected to it to regurgitate in verbal form the sins and crimes of their past lives. Toast was a ritual item devoured by fetishists in the belief that it would enhance their kinetic and sexual powers. Toast cannot be explained by any rational means. Toast is me. I am toast. And uh, yeah, there are still like household pets knocking around, but obviously they're really ill prepared to survive with the wasteland. Uh, so the snowman actually drove away a dog. Um, because it was sink or swim, but he thinks, what a fool he'd been. He'd let them go to waste. He should have eaten them or taken one in, trained it to catch rabbits or to defend him or something. So we get this little conversation between Oryx and Jimmy when he's looking back. So I learned about life, said Oryx. Learned what, said Jimmy. He shouldn't have had the pizza and the weed they'd smoked on top of that. He was feeling a little sick. That everything has a price. Not everything, that can't be true. You can't buy time, you can't buy... He wanted to say love, but hesitated. It was too soppy. You can't buy it, but it has a price, said Oryx. Everything has a price. Not me, said Jimmy, trying to joke. I don't have a price. Wrong, as usual. We get a reference to a fundamentalist vegan called Bernice who had stringy hair held back with a wooden clip in the shape of a toucan and wore a succession of God's Gardener's t-shirts which, due to her aversion to chemical compounds such as underarm deodorant, stank even when freshly laundered. For me, I just think that's lazy stereotyping, but I suppose veganism wasn't as well known or as sort of widely understood back in the day. We got a use of the word neurotypicals for people who um, don't have Asperger's syndrome, which I thought was interesting. Um, it's kind of more popular that word now than it would have been when this book was written. And I thought this was just a fun little paragraph. One of his term papers for his applied rhetoric course was titled Self-Help Books of the 20th Century, Exploiting Hope and Fear. And it supplied him with a great stand-up routine for use in the student pubs. He'd quote snatches of this and that. Improve your self-image, the 12-step plan for assisted suicide. How to make friends and influence people. Flat abs in five weeks. You can have it all. Entertaining without a maid. Grief management for dummies. And the circle around him would crack up. And this is a vision of the future from the artists of this time. Soon, said the artists, ignoring him, there would be nothing left but a series of long subterranean tubes covering the surface of the planet. The air and light inside them would be artificial, the ozone and oxygen layers of planet Earth having been totally destroyed. People would creep along through this tubing, single file, stark naked, their only view the asshole of the one before them in the line, their urine and excrement flowing down through vents in the floor, until they were randomly selected by a digitalized mechanism, at which point they would be sucked into a side tunnel, ground up and fed to the others through a series of nipple-shaped appendages on the inside of the tube. The system would be self-sustaining and perpetual and would serve everybody right. So just like this little uh, opening to a paragraph here. So this was the rest of his life. It felt like a party to which he'd been invited, but at an address he couldn't actually locate. Someone must be having fun at it, this life of his. Only right at the moment, it wasn't him. We get another little dig at veganism here. You'd be surprised how many people would like a very beautiful, smart baby that eats nothing but grass. The vegans are highly interested in that little item. And finally, I wanted to highlight this. Um, there was a change in Craig's fridge magnets. You could tell a lot about a person from their fridge magnets. Not that he thought much about them at the time. So yeah, Oryx and Crake by Margaret Atwood. Going back through it, there are more little digs at veganism than I remember there being in this, um, which don't really need to be there. I don't really know why they're there. But um, yeah, I enjoyed the themes of it. The writing was pretty good. As I say, it's kind of like speculative fiction, science fiction, um, with a bit of like literary fiction thrown in. It's the first in a trilogy, so I am gonna read the rest of the trilogy at some point. But overall, I gave uh, Oryx and Crake by Margaret Atwood a four out of five. So there we have it, that's what I made of Oryx and Crake by Margaret Atwood. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.